Have you any idea how much weight you lose? No. When you're doing this? But I have to eat <laughs> an awful lot. You go to hell of a lick, don't you? No, there's a lot of running. There's a lot yeah. of uh, manoeuvring, as I call it. I eat a lot. I eat a lot during the day. And it is that thing. I mean, any actor who's ever played one of these types of roles will tell you you have to you have to plan your whole day around it in order to get it right. Otherwise, you're you come out here in this vast web. I'm talking to Olivia and Burton and all that. Do you stand in the wings thinking, God, oh God, oh God? Are you were very, very nervous before you walk on. No. You see, some people are, some aren't. Don't they? No, I mean, I, I I have a form of nerves, and some nights it's it's about it's about thinking, oh gosh, this is going to be different, and I don't quite know what it's going to be. But it's ne I never. I never have a, a, a seizure of terror, the sort of seizures that they would talk about. Yeah. Moments, definitely, yeah. definitely. But um, I, I, I think, you know, we need a bit of it. We always oh, have absolutely. a bit of it. Otherwise. They all say just pumping up the adrenaline. Yeah. Max Beerbohm wrote that uh, Hamlet is a roll, a hoop, through which every eminent actor sooner or later has to jump. What made you jump now? Kind of makes me sound like a, a circus performer. Uh, <laughs> I suppose there is an element to that. It won't make me jump now. Uh, age, life experience, most importantly, um, the opportunity to bring a new audience to a 400-year-old piece of brilliance and um, to try and make Shakespeare as relevant now as he uh, has ever been since then. And uh, I think... I, for, we're, it's strange that I mean I've just become a father and I used to think that I'd have to be childless to be a Hamlet and I thought well maybe that's going to be a difficult ingredient to play with it's it's miraculous though as, as I'm sure you know being a dad that you're 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 thinking about how you were parented shoots up as well so that's all fed into it so that was serendipity though that wasn't as planned as this was um, it's been you know it's just been the it really felt like the right time and also finding the right partner in crime and I, I approached Lindsay Turner to direct this a good couple of years ago and we we really took our time with finding the right space the right production team to go with and the right sort of scope and world to create this play in but there's a feeling I don't think necessarily mini hoop as a sort of circus thing more mm. as there is this maybe a, a better analogy might the unreconstructed Beecher's Brook. It's coming at you, this enormous fence, yeah. before they made it smaller. And, it's a and, huge and a lot wave. Of the, and and most yeah. of the great actors have said, well, I'm going to have to do this. Yeah. At different ages, I mean, yeah. all sorts. And, uh, and you must have felt part of that deep breath, well... A few people were asking me more than I was asking myself, actually, uh, to, to begin with. I, I, in the back of my mind, I thought, well, maybe one day. I mean, I began my professional career in Regent's Park and, and with Shakespeare and had a wonderful time there, um, two seasons running. And Shakespeare is a huge part of my very privileged education. And so it had been around me and in me from a very young age. Um, and I've seen some truly extraordinary Hamlets in my time. Stephen Delane, Simon Russell Beale, Mark Rylance, Rory Kinnear, to name a few, and Sam West. So I, it's been part of my culture, both as a as a as a as a an actor seeking nourishment in the culture of theatre, and as a um, as somebody who it might be expected from one day. But I mean, on that on that regard, it really did come from other people to begin with. And when are you going to do it? Yeah, yeah, no, really. And and then I just I, I thought, oh, oh. Is there a sort of biological clock ticking for an actor to do this by a certain time? And I, I don't know. I mean, we've seen all sorts of different ages. I mean, Simon was, some people say, older than Hamlet normally is. And we've seen Ben Whishaw, who I missed off that list, who was a, a, a genius, is a genius, and was just exceptional as a very raw, young Hamlet. So it wasn't that so much. It was really about feeling it, really feeling it in my bones as to be the right time. And I'm very glad it's now rather than when I was when it was first possible, or even at school when I was first offered it by a teacher there. Um, I was desperate to do it, but I had A-levels I tried to get, so <laughs> I knew it would, uh, it would muck with my concentration, to say the least. It's, it's got to be something that you can commit yourself to completely as well. I mean, as a hoop or any other metaphor for it, you know, it's like a massive wave, and there are nights when you think, Christ, I'm, I know it's coming, I know it's there, but before you're ne you know it, you are, you are in this incredible web and this, this, this sort of force, this drive of the play just takes you over. And there are nights when you go, and I, I can feel myself pushing and reaching to keep up with it. And there are other nights when it just, it's in everything, every 
sort of molecule of your body, and it's, it's a wonderful experience to have. And I'm glad I'm having it now rather than older or younger. Before I move away from that, just to sort of uh, rummage it a little bit more, mm. would you have felt a lesser actor if you hadn't tried to do this or done it, as it were? Um, no. Oh, that's a really difficult hypothetical question. I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. Because, you know, I've never set out to complete a sort of bucket list of great parts in any canon of, of, of dramatic art. I, I, I've been fortunate to get to a stage where I can take some risky choices and, and, and what I like to do is basically keep learning and risk and do things I haven't done before. So to say would I have felt a lesser actor for not, I don't think so, no. I don't think so. I just, I really, I had a strong drive to do the play with the people I approached to do it with and it's, it's come together for the right reasons and it's not just about the part, it's also to bring the play to a culture. And I think that's a very important part of it. You, you can have great uh, Hamlets, you don't necessarily always have great productions and I, I, that was a hugely important part of why I took my time with it. I'll come back to that later, but you said in your opening remarks and you were bringing a new audience to it, which you certainly did. That's, that's been a remarkable thing, a very attendant audience, as well as the cognoscenti of the usual Barbican crowd, which, of course, we want to appeal to people who come to yeah. see Van der Ho and um, Complicite and all the other brilliant people who, who are housed by this incredible art centre. Well, so I've been a couple of times so far, and they've just been... People have been like hairs. Yeah. Waiting. Waiting, yeah, exactly. yes, yes. Which is, which is, it's very exciting. It's exciting for all of us on stage to have that. So to get to, to get to the play, um, mm. the Stephen Greenblatt, the author and critic, talks about the soliloquy as being about a new, intense representation of inwardness, even for Shakespeare. And they seem to me, this is just my opinion, as the centre and the glory of the play. This, this play by a genius about a genius, which is. Um, and I thought you, they were wonderfully spoken and presented. And the, the, so can we just talk about one or two of them? Because the, what's going on is quite fa fantastic, isn't it, really? I but the first thing, before we talk about the meaning, yes. uh, and what is it like coming up to, to be or not to be, when you know that it, they're the best known lines in world theatre? And people are chanting the first two or three lines of that speech in their in their inner minds. Uh, and you oh, they, have to come I'll never to be able to say it again now. That <laughs> <laughs> but you have to come to it One, as if it's two, fresh. three. <laughs> just yeah, it's going to be a, a chant along. Uh, but well, you have it, to come to it as if you're thinking it for the first time. But that is it. I mean, that's that's the trick of any acting in a present moment. I think is to it's to find the need. Mm. It's to find the need to say it. And the soliloquies chart. I mean, what you said is absolutely true. There's this immediate access you get to a consciousness in an unconscious world. It's not just the sort of metaphysical, philosophical point of is there a world that exists outside of our brains or is the, all this stuff we're receiving, tastes, emotions, anything sensory or anything outside of ourselves even real? What I mean by that is he sees himself isolated in an uncaring world that he doesn't inhabit or want to inhabit to begin with in the play. The first two soliloquies, the first being, oh, there's two, two, and it's important to talk about them in order, I think, because that's how we've tackled them. It's about the need at each point for him to say what he's saying. The first soliloquy for me, oh, that this two, two solid flesh would melt Thor and resolve itself into a dew, is wishing himself to be absent from a world that he feels is utterly devoid of meaning, of understanding, of humanity, because of what he's experienced as a grieving son watching his mother remarry within a month to his uncle. So you meet a man who's in a very particular psychological state, who's just broken through this kind of extraordinary time warp and kind of stick, stuck his head out towards an audience who've been involved in the world of a play they've been introduced to, a king who's talked about what the state of the politics of the world is, what the state of the state is of Denmark, this new marriage, this new accord of peace in, in the wake of his brother's death. And the political world outside, as I was saying, with um, Fortinbras. So you have, this, you have this sort of State of the Union address and this sort of preamble to a much bigger party that goes on and on through the night to celebrate the beginning of a new Denmark. And then you have a man who's not dressed as any of the others addressed, who is already isolated, 
who's denied escaping from this world, which she's obviously abhorring of and detests. And he just slips through to talk to an audience in a completely honest way about why he cannot stand what is going on around him. And to him, it's the world that's at fault in that first soliloquy.